In this lecture, we will discuss the pharmacokinetics of intravenous induction. If you want to read more about this topic, then I recommend this book to you here, Gerald Worley's Real World Guide to Pharmacokinetics and Other Things. The relevant chapter is chapter number two, Asleep in 10 Seconds. Induction kinetics, according to traditional modeling, goes like this. We have a central compartment. We have a desired initial concentration. Concentration equals amount divided by volume. We rearrange the equation, punch in the numbers, and we get a loading dose or an induction dose. The drug then distributes into and redistributes out of the peripheral compartments and the effect site. However, if I were to ask you exactly what happens when you inject propofol into the back of the hand, the answer you might give would be a bit more like this. We inject the drug into the back of the hand and it travels along the upper limb in the veins. It then enters the thorax and mixes with the large volume of blood in the thorax as well as the blood returning to the right heart from other areas of the body. It travels across the pulmonary circulation and enters the left heart. From there, it is ejected up into the brain, at which point the patient will become unconscious if a sufficient dose has been given. This is, of course, what is meant by one arm brain circulation. In fact, all of these circulation times have been figured out. This is basically what is described in Chapter 2 of Gerald's book. Specifically, the most important variables in induction kinetics are the cardiac output and the central blood volume. We also see that if the induction dose is administered over 30 seconds rather than 10 seconds, then there is a significant decrease in the peak concentration of the induction agent, and therefore a lower risk of cardiovascular toxicity. I encourage you to pause the video and read this text in your own time. It would be great if there were kinetic models capable of accurately estimating induction dose requirement. Until then, all we can do is call upon experience and intuition, which is to say that we employ a calculation process that is subconscious. The closest I can get to answering the question, how much propofol should we give, uh, is this table. In summary, traditional compartment modeling does not do a very good job of explaining what happens at intravenous induction. Cardiac output and blood volume are the most important variables. The arm brain circulation time is very fast in children and very slow in the elderly. An underdose is both more likely to happen and more risky in youth. An overdose is both more likely and more risky in old age or in severe illness.